into liberty. Out of that bondage, that old bound mind that told us back, but it ain't there no more. Amen. And what's trying to dangle on is going to fall off because the Lord's shaking us. In this hour, the winds are blowing and the Spirit is raining down the goodness of the Lord. Amen. In the land of the living. And we're being made aware more than ever before that we have come out of something dark and dreary. We've come out of some doubt into the day. We've come right out of the out of the darkness of man's thinking and we've been delivered into thinking like God thinks. Hallelujah. And what he thinks is totally different than what man thinks. Uh, glory to God. I tell you, you know, when you never met nobody before and you got some important engagement with them or appointment with them, your mind will run a thousand directions before you ever meet them trying to interpret what kind of person they are, what kind of nature they'll be of. And most of the time you go in and it ain't nothing like you thought. Uh, most of the time you go in and the spirit is not the same as you anticipated it to be. Uh, it's usually better than what you thought it was going to be. Usually it doesn't take as long and it isn't as hard and it isn't as difficult. And you've dreaded that thing for a week. Uh, and when you get there, the Lord just went ahead of you. Hallelujah. And we're everything out. That's the way we've been with God. We've tried to conceive Him, uh, tried to mentally capacitate His goodness and greatness, uh, and it's not doable in the natural. Uh, but brother, when you hear the right word of the Lord, and it awakens that spirit uh, on the inside of you, uh, you start to really fall in love with Him. Hallelujah. Up till then, you served Him because you knew you should. Uh, you served Him because it was the right thing to do. But how many is a servant him this morning uh, because you have been smitten uh, by his love for you. Uh, glory to God, you're no longer just looking at him as some high rank in general that you're under, but you see you've established contact and made a relationship. Amen. And I'll tell you when you base your faith, glory to God, on relationship. Instead of works. Instead of law, instead of should and should. Oh my God, I tell you, you've opened up the world of deliverance in your life. Because when that old mess tries to come up on you, say, oh no, I don't live that way no more. As, it, as used to be the way I've seen it. But I just don't see it that way no more. Raise your hands and let's praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord.
speak and say unto thee, my people, that thy future is bright and thy days ahead are filled with plenty, saith the Lord. Yea, saith the Lord, I have sketched out and mapped out the place of your perfection. And I would say unto thee that I've skillfully laid out a way and a path for thy feet to walk upon. And I would say that thou needst not worry about stumbling or falling. For yea, I the Lord am your shield and your buckler. This day saith the Lord. Yea, I have covered thee with my feathers. Yea, I've shielded thee on every side. Yea, this day in my anointing I will dispel fear. And I will remove gloom from your hearts. And yea, I shall put an uplook in your outlook. I shall open your eyes and enlighten you with a spirit of faith that will conquer mountains this day, saith the Spirit of the Lord. So walk before me boldly. Lift up thy countenance and shine brightly. Yea, lift up thy voice and cry loudly that the Lord is my helper and the Lord has made a way for me, saith the Spirit of God. And yea, look not upon nothing as though it is undoable or impossible, uh, but know this hour that I have every answer you need, uh, and that as you yield to my glory and my anointing, I shall make the answers clear. Uh, so fear nothing and doubt nothing this hour, uh, but yea, rest strongly upon me, uh, for I am here uh, to deliver thee out, saith the Spirit of the Lord. Glory oh, to God. Woo, hallelujah. Shoot, my God. Well, he's giving us answers today. How many is looking for answers? Well, you can get them right here today. There ain't no need for anybody to leave here puzzled about anything God's got. Hallelujah. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Before you say that word, the Lord said to tell Sister Pam up here, Sister Pam, you
And I want you holding back from nothing. Yea, I do not want you holding back because of finance. I do not want you holding back because of fear. I do not want you holding back because you don't think your bodies can do it. I want you to leap out in me. I want you to take giant steps this day, saith the Lord. I'm calling you to stretch your faith uh, and to go out upon the limb uh, and to see that my word really is what I said it is. It is surety unto thee. So do not get up and just shuffle a little and say, see there, nothing happened. No, no, reach out, stretch thyself. This day, saith the Lord, make a major step in me and you shall see major manifestations uh, because you have obeyed my word, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, the Lord is just setting up his word to perform it. That's all he's doing. You can turn with me to 1 Kings 19, but I'm going to read first so you can just listen from Habakkuk 2 because the Lord put this scripture in my mind for me to read this morning. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables so that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. Amen. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Hallelujah. And later on in this chapter, he starts giving out a lot of woes to a lot of things that just weren't of God. So they had to go, and they had to be pushed out of the way. But right in the middle of it, he gives you the reason for the departure. He said, because the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the whole earth. And that's why it has to leave. You know, religion takes a lot of stuff from you, but they don't give you anything in its place. It'll take a lot of things from you, but it doesn't give you anything in its place. But the Lord's not taking things from you just to take them from you. If he's taking away the old way, it's because he has a new way. If he's taking out the garbage, it's because he's about to fill it with the glory. And Matt was talking about answers this morning. You know, every answer you need is in the glory. You could spend hours looking for it. Even in this word, you could spend hours looking for it. But if you would just get in the glory, in a matter of seconds, he could send you to the right scripture, the right minister to listen to, the right song to speak to you, the right answer, the right dream, whatever you needed to hear, just in a moment, it could be over. In one moment. You can search and you can look and you can look and you can look or you can get up on the tower and say, I'm going to see what the Lord has to say to me. And whatever he says, I'm going to do it. And you know, we've already been given a vision that's been written and been plain for us. I thought this morning when the Lord was speaking to me, I thought, you know, I'm not going to get up and say anything new because it's the same thing we've been saying. The vision has been made plain and it's time to run with it. And just like Matt just gave that word, it's not time to look around at what's going on. And the Lord told me this morning, we're going to start moving by unction. We've been moving too much by what we see, what we feel, what's going on around us. When this gets better, just like he said, when my body gets better, when my finances get better, when my family gets better, when this is just right, I'll get up and move. No, the time is to move by unction. And a lot of times that unction comes even when it looks like in the natural Absolutely the wrong time. Yes. All right. And I wanted to read to you from 1 Kings chapter 19. This is the story of Elijah. And this happened right after his showdown with the prophets of Baal. And he had had this big showdown with the prophets of Baal, and they had called on God, and he had said, you know, why are we going to sit between two opinions? That's right. How long are we going to sit here and serve two gods? How long are we going to sit here and try to keep them both happy? Let's decide right now who really is God. And so they had this big showdown on the mountain, and it was proven beyond any doubt that the Lord was Lord. Because Baal didn't answer. The God answered with fire. And you would think that he was coming down off this real big high, and you would think he would be real full of faith. But when we read here, it said, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, 
And more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and, rent and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am, better, for I am not better than my father's. He decided it was over. How many times have we done that? We get a big victory and then just because we hear of a threat. That's right. Just the sound of a threat. Yeah. And we go running and we decide it's over. And we've all been guilty of it. At just the noise of war, yeah. right. we start to get upset and we start to get in fear. And we start running. And you know, if he had really wanted to die, he just would have stayed there sure. with Jezebel. Because right. <laughs> if he had really wanted to die, he could have done it right there. Right. And aren't we all the same way? And isn't religion the same way? They tell you just to give it up, it's whatever God wills, but then you go to four different doctors trying to <laughs> save your own life, even though we've said, oh, it's, it's whatever the Lord wills. Yeah. Well, that's not true. There's a desire in us all to live. Yeah. And there's a reason for that, because God is life. Yeah. There's no shadow of death in Him. There's no turning in Him. So we have this great desire to live on this earth and to do what we're called to do, simply because He put it in us. That's it. He's full of life, so therefore we desire life. Even if we don't understand it, even if we look in all the wrong places. You know, they wrote that song, Looking in for Love in All the Wrong Places. And isn't that the truth? We may look for it in all the wrong places, but the truth is the desire for it is a God-given gift. Yes. That desire for life, that desire for love is a God-given <coughs> gift, and He wants you to run to Him for it. Just like the desire for answers to your problems. You know, it's not, you're not weak because you want to get out of the storm. Religion will tell you that's weakness. Well, ask it for that storm to stop. They'll say, no, you just need to bear through it. You remember the prayer, the prayer of serenity. Just give me strength to bear that which I cannot change. That's what religion says. Lord, just, you know, if you don't move the mountain, then at least give me the strength to climb it. Or at least give me the strength to endure it. That's what religion teaches. Yeah. Except for Jesus never said any of that. Never. Except for you can't find it in the Bible. That's right. He said, speak to the mountain. Yes. And if you sp spoke and you believed that it would be cast into the sea, it didn't have a choice. And when they woke him up in the middle of the storm, he didn't say, it's all right, boys, just hunger down. We're going to get through this. Right. That's not what he said. He got up and he said, peace be still. Yeah. He didn't say they had to go through anything. You know, no one ever came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm sick. Will you hear, heal me? And he said, no, you're just going to have to endure it a little bit longer. Yeah. If you can just hold out faithful five months from now, you'll be well, I promise. That's not what he said. When the leper came to him and he said, if you, can heal, if you will heal me, I know that you can. Jesus said, I will. Not sometime later, not sometime down the road, not after you learn your lesson, not when the Lord feels like you're going through enough, but right now I will. And he laid hands on him, and that was it. It was over. Cleanse. So you wanting to be out of your storm, you're seeking an answer, that's not because you're weak. That is a God-given right put on the inside of you that rises up and says it's not supposed to be like this. You know, the Lord is all blessing all the time. There's no curse in him. That's why when they were in the garden, you don't find any curse. You can't find it because it didn't exist back then. And why didn't it exist? Everything was like God. Everything was good. Everything was how he had made it. So when things go crazy in your life, there's a reason why you desire it to be changed and changed immediately. Because everything in you desires the blessing and not the curse. Everything in you knows that that's just not right. That somehow that's just not the way it's supposed to be. And so when you start looking for those answers, don't feel like that's a weakness. Don't feel like you're asking too much of God. Don't feel like, well, you know, he just blessed me last week, so maybe I'm just being greedy now if I ask him to do it this week. Don't feel like that. That's what religion teaches. You know, he just gave me a new dress last week, so he'd be greedy to ask for another one this week. You know, he just gave me a brand new car, so maybe I should hold off before I start asking for a nice place to live in because... That's kind of greed if I just start going after all that. Well, that's not true. He said that, I, I, beloved, I wish above all things 
that you be blessed and that you prosper even as your soul prospers. So you're supposed to be prosperous and you're supposed to have the answer every time you turn around. You were never supposed to walk in darkness. In fact, he delivered you out of the kingdom of darkness and said, come on over into the light. Because in the light, you have every answer. I don't have to ask you today which way is the way out of either door because the lights are on and I clearly see the way. Well, you're not supposed to have to ask every 10 seconds which way to go and fumble around in darkness and not know the way to go because we're children of the light. And if you're children of the day, you can see. You can see the way. Well, how do I see it? In the glory. You just get over in the Spirit of God. You start looking with a different pair of eyes. If you look with just your natural eyes, you're always going to see chaos. That's what it always picks up on is the chaos around you. You ever notice you can go into a room and it can be clean all but one piece of clothing or something on the couch? And what do you notice? The one piece of clothing on the couch. You don't notice how clean all the rest of it is. You just, your eye automatically goes to what's out of place. That's why you can't trust your natural eyes. It will always focus on what's out of place. That's where you have to get in the spirit and see in the spirit and see that nothing, you know, Rick Manis tells about a dream he had where he was in, in the presence of the Lord. And he said he sat down and he was talking to him and it was almost like there was a stack of blocks or something on the table next to him. And during that conversation, he accidentally knocked it off. And yet it all went right back up into place. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know what that meant, but the Lord showed him, he said, because nothing can get out of order here. Yeah. In the kingdom, everything goes right back to its natural place. You can't make it somehow out of order. You can't somehow mess it up. Sometimes the reason we hold back, it's just like Matt said, we are in such fear that we're going to mess it up. Yeah. Instead of trusting in a God that wouldn't let us fail, instead of trusting that he would take care of us no matter what, Instead of trusting in his unending love for us, that even if you did it wrong, he can't stop loving you, he can't stop blessing you, he can't stop, all he would do would be, you know, they talk about the correction of the Lord. But in the Bible, the correction of the Lord, it said he corrects you because he's a loving father. Right. And it's not meant to put you down or to hurt right. you. It's always meant to lift you up yeah, and uplift you and make you better. Yeah. And so here Elijah is, and he is scared for his life. He's given up. He said, Lord, I'd just rather die. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. If you feel like your journey is too great, you don't have to worry. Because he is sustaining you all along the way. Sometimes we're so afraid of the journey. And because we know we can't do it in our own strength, we let it hold us back. But, you know, Elijah didn't even have to repent before the Lord sent that angel there. He didn't even have to get it all right with God. He just went on to sleep. And what happened? The angel showed up. Sometimes, I've heard Matt say this, sometimes the best thing you can do is go on to sleep. Stop worrying about your problems. Stop getting all in a tizzy because Jesus said, how by any of your worrying could you make your stature one inch taller? Could you add one more hair to your head? Could you do any of those things by sitting around and worrying about it? If, it had, if worry was going to get it done, it would have been done. If getting upset about it was going to solve the problem, it would be solved already. Because we've all worried and we've all gotten upset over it all before. And if that was the answer, it would have already solved it. There wouldn't be a problem to solve anymore. But sometimes you just need to go on and go to sleep. And he will, you know, David said in the night that he'll visit you. And he'll bring you night visions and night songs and a song to sing in that time. And so you can go on and go to sleep because he's bringing provision your way. You don't have to worry about it. He's bringing provision for everything you need. We have a lot of things written down on those papers back there that this church wants to do. But it is not up to us to try to find a way to provide for it. He's bringing the provision. He's bringing it in. He's bringing it in. And it really doesn't matter if he brings it in through you and I or if we just walk out there tomorrow and find a sack full of money sitting there to do all that we need to do. It doesn't matter to us how he brings it. We just know he's bringing it. So the journey may look too great for us when you look at all those promises that the Lord gave us. It may look like it's too great for us. It doesn't matter. It's not up to us. 
Right. It's not about our strength. The Word says it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit, says the Lord. Yeah. And even in your own personal life, there may be things that look too great for you. Yeah. That job may look too great for you to get. It may look like you don't have enough education. It may look like you don't have enough experience. It may look like you just aren't that good at it. Well, guess what? It doesn't have to be about you. Favor isn't fair. Right. Right. It's not about you. If he says it's yours, it's yours. Right. I, I can't even remember who I heard say this, but they were talking about Esther. And remember what Mordecai said, she, he said, how do you know that you weren't put here for such a time as this? And she was. The whole reason that she was queen was because the Lord knew that she sure. needed to save her people. He had put her in that position for that reason. And I heard someone preach on that, and they said, you know, she did look beautiful when she walked in there. And she had been laying in, that, in those oil and in those spices. But the truth was, she could have tripped and fell on her face when she walked in there, and it wouldn't have changed anything. Right. She still would have gotten her place as queen. Why? Because it was ordained of God. Yeah. And nothing could have changed it. Didn't matter how beautiful the other women were, and I'm sure they were very beautiful, because no one was allowed to come in that wasn't. They had searched the whole kingdom for the most beautiful women in the world. Didn't matter how beautiful the rest of them were. Didn't matter what they said. All that mattered was the plan of God was happening. So it doesn't matter what else is going on in your life. It doesn't matter if somebody has more education than you. It doesn't matter if somebody knows more than you. It doesn't even matter in this church if somebody's been in the Word longer than you. If the Lord says it's for you, it's for you. You don't have to wait. You know, the blessing is not, God is not a God that cares about what um, people look like on the outside, what their educational background is. He says, I look at the heart. That's what he told Sam. He said, I don't care that those men are the strongest men. I don't care that they're warriors. I don't care how big they are. I'm not looking at how big they are. I'm looking at their heart. And he's not looking at how big you are or how great you are, or how much you have to offer Him. He's looking at one thing, your heart. Do you have a heart that seeks after Him? Do you have a heart that wants to know His Word? Because if you do, then He'll talk. That's it. All you have, what you have to have to hear from the Lord? A listening ear. In the book of Revelation, it says, To him that has an ear to hear. And it started talking. Now, if you don't have an ear to hear... We can talk and we can talk and you can come sit in the same church service with us and we can talk and we can talk and we can prophesy and we can lay hands. And if you have no ear to hear, it won't make one bit of difference in your life. You'll go home and you'll live the same old life. You'll go home and you'll face the same old problems and you won't know how to deal with them because you don't have an ear to hear. That's why you can have two people sitting in the exact same service and it seems as though one got so blessed and one just went around and said, yes, yeah, good service. Can't tell you what they spoke on. Can't tell you what happened. Yes, yeah, some prophecies came forth, but I don't remember what they were. Why? Their ear wasn't there to hear. They showed up, but they didn't hear anything. So, I don't want you to worry about the journey. Too many of us are getting bogged down in that journey. And we're worried about the journey. And there's an angel of God standing right there with everything you need to make it through the journey. And you're worried about the journey. And if you just open your eyes and look, it's already sitting there. It's already prepared. So he arose and did eat and drink that second time. And went in the strength of that meat for 40 days and 40 nights unto Hor, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord showed up, and Elijah started having a pity party. And how many times do we go in our prayer closet and we have a pity party? Lord, I've served you. Lord, I've done all this. Lord, I've given. And if I give it, then why don't I see my finances blessed? Lord, I ran around the church like I felt led to, and now my foot still hurts. And Lord, why? Well, I've been zealous for you, so why does it hurt again? We just have our pity party, and I'm the only one, and nobody else knows how bad it is but me. And how many times do we do that? Nobody else understands. Nobody's as sick as me. They just don't understand. They want me to sit 
sit there and praise the Lord. They don't know how bad I have it. They don't know how hard it is. They want me to come to church all the time. They don't know how hard it is for me to go to church. They don't know. But it's our pity party. And Elijah did the same thing. Lord, I've been zealous for you. And nobody else is. And nobody else cares. And now they're just trying to kill me for what I did. It was all for nothing. It was all in vain. So I'm just going to hide in this cave. And many people do. They give up on church. They give up on life. And they go and they hide in their cave. And they die in their pity party. Because they've given up. I tried it. It didn't work. Just like the word that just came forth. I shuffled on out there a little bit. And I didn't see the answer in that little bit. I shuffled. So it must not have worked. And that's exactly what Elijah said. And the Lord said, he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now the Lord spoke to me about this section and I'm, I love signs and wonders. And I love for the wind to blow through here and the fire to fall. And if this whole place shook until the rafters were shaken, I'd love it. But what he spoke to me about here, though, was sometimes, you know, we take a very natural outlook on this. Yeah. And we're looking for the Lord in the middle of our storm. Because we think that's where he is. So you hear all these songs about people being in the storm and just, you know, wanting the shadow of Jesus to pass them by. Or, you know, looking for him in the chaos as if you're going to find him there. Well, he doesn't exist in chaos. So if it's a glory fire, wonderful. But if you're just looking for him to be in the fire of your trials and show up, and I don't mean show up like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego show up and deliver you. I mean us just sitting and waiting around and praise God at least. I know he's with me even though I'm about to die. Right. No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is he is not there in your chaos. Right. He is not a part of it. Sure. He may be there, but he's not entered into that chaos right. with you. Right. It's just like the pity party. You can have it, and the Lord's there the whole time that you're having it, but he won't enter into it with you. He can stand right there and look at you while you do it. You're never alone, but he's not entering into it with you. He's not at chaos. He's at peace, and he can't help but produce peace. So know that if he shows up in the fire, you will be delivered because he is delivered. So it's not a matter of you going through the storm and hoping that he just stays by your side through the whole thing. If he shows up in your storm, it's to calm it. If he shows up in your chaos, it's to bring peace. You know, we want to have both. We want to hang on to both. It's like putting new wine into old wineskins. You want to hang on to both. You want your stormy life, but you want the Lord to be right there with you beside it. You know, it's kind of like the, uh, the bumper sticker, Jesus is my co-pilot. Yeah. So you still want to pilot it, but you want him to sit right there beside right. you while you do it. While you make your own decisions, while you go your own way, but let him just sit right here next to me so that I can feel like I'm going to be go to heaven when I die and it'll all be okay. Well, that's not how the Lord works. If he shows up, he shows out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how he works. He is not there just to be your little blanket to cuddle up to. I'm glad he's a comforter, but you know, his kind of comfort isn't just a pat on the back. His uh, comfort is we can do something about yeah, this mess. Yeah, yeah. We can get you out of this. The comforter didn't come just to leave you in your mess. Amen. When the comforter came, signs and wonders started happening everywhere. Yes, and it started happening through his people. And when Peter and John showed up at the gate called Beautiful after they had met the comforter, they didn't say, it's okay, don't worry about it, you'll go to heaven when you die, to the lame man. In fact, he wasn't even looking at them, and they said, hey, look over here. Look on us, we've got something. Hallelujah. We've got something that's going to deliver you, and it's not silver and it's not gold, because that will only keep you for so long. I'm tired of answers that only keep us for so long. Some of us are just being kept. We're not prosperous, we're not succeeding, but we're just kept alive and we're going on in the same old little drudgerous life. And even though it's pitiful and it's depressing and it's all those things, at least we're kept. Well, I don't want to be kept. I want to be prosperous. I don't want you to leave me there lame, sitting down by there and just hand me some gold and have enough food for a couple of days. I want you to totally raise me up. And that's what the world's looking for. 
That's why, you know, a watered down gospel won't work. It'll draw them in for so long and then it's over. Because it's watered down. Because it doesn't teach total deliverance. Because it says that you're going to have to deal with this sin your whole life. Instead of saying that sin was taken care of, they just tell them they all have to live with it. Well, you don't have to live with it. And you don't have to live that way. And you don't even have to claw your way out of it. There's an instant and total deliverance that exists only in Christ. You can't find it anywhere else. Can't find it in a pill. Can't find it in a program. Can't find it anywhere else. I'm not anti us doing things for our kids, but you know, a thousand programs will not keep our kids in a relationship with God. It can't do it. It's just a program. It's fun, but you know, fun ends. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a blessing from the Lord, but it will not keep them. It will not teach them that they don't have to be sick. It will not teach them that they don't have to live a life of sin. It will not teach them how to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. The only thing that's going to do that is bringing them into the glory. I've been reading back over Harvest Glory some, and you know, one of the, when she first starts out that book, she was going to the nations at 16 years old. That's right. And you read it, and you know, we think of 16-year-olds, and we don't think of no, kids no. that are interested in going to That's the nations the and preaching the word. We think of kids that are running around, acting crazy, immature. That's how we see them. Not how God sees them, mind you. That's how we see them. Okay? So I'm not talking about what the Lord sees. Because there is no age in God. And if you get over in the Holy Ghost, He don't care if you're 6 or you're 60. He'll talk to you. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what happened to her. But how did it happen? Because she said that when she would go back to from home from school on Wednesdays, they were having prayer services, and they would pray for hours, and then they would just sit in the glory for the last hour. And that those sounds of glory, she just couldn't escape them. Just couldn't escape them. It just became a part of her. So even though as a child she didn't want to be a missionary, when her mother would say it to her, it upset her because she didn't want to do that. And she said, I don't know if the Lord ever asked me to be a missionary, but I started asking him to be one. Uh-huh. Why? Because the glory did something to her. Yeah. The glory changed her. The glory will change us. Yeah. It will do something to us. Yeah. That you don't have to worry about, well, I don't quite have this right yet. It doesn't matter. In the glory, the Lord changes all that. Glory. He'll give, you know, remember what the word says that he's told his people. He said, I'm going to take out your heart of stone. And I'm going to put in a brand new heart. A new one that's not hard. A new one that is not hard for me to deal with. Some of us just need to let the Lord take out that old hard heart. And let him put a new one within us. That's pliable. That's easy. Just like the potter that works the clay and gets to shape it into whatever vessel he wants. That he can come in our lives and he can shape us however we want. And we don't let our old hard hearts that are hardened with fear get in the way. But we just let him come and we let him shape us. So, you know, it says that he wasn't in all those things. They were great manifestations, but that's not where he was. And so, um, let's see, and after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and slain your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he was still having this pity for him, even after he heard that still small voice. And the, another thing that the Lord spoke to me about, you, you know, you could have a thousand angels show up and tell you exactly what to do. But don't think that's any greater than hearing the still small voice within you telling you exactly what to do. You know, you may have a great vision and you may have a great dream, but if you're going to move with the unction of God, you cannot put it in a box and say it has to be this way. You have to be willing to sit down and hear even the still small voice of God. And the truth is, if he can speak to you that way, then you know that you're close to him. Because if he has to yell and scream... And if it takes a thousand angels to get your attention, then you probably weren't listening all that well. You probably had a lot of crowdedness going on in that mind. Sometimes it's just crowdedness in our life. And the Lord's been speaking that to us, and he's been dealing with me about it. We just crowd them out. We plan them out. Even even in innocent things, I'm not saying you're purposely saying I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and I'm just not going to make time for the Lord because I don't got time for that. 
I mean that your good intentions lead you down a road where it's just all your works, 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 and then you turn around and you haven't even thought about the Lord all day. And you haven't listened to Him all day. So you have no idea if He was trying to tell you something that morning because you never stopped to find out if He was trying to tell you something that morning. That That's a word as much to myself. That's not a word of of judgment. That's a, a word of correction. That every morning we have to get up and, Lord, what do you want to do today? Day by day. Because His plans and His ways are far above our thoughts, right. our plans, our ways. And you may have all your day planned out to do this, and He may be saying, I oh, know there's someone over here. <coughs> and you need to go over there you need to speak to them. You may be planning to do it, you know, even in the smallest things, you may be planning to go shopping over here and buy a dress because you need one. And He's saying, no, go over here because He knows the one that you're going to love and the one that's going to be just right for you is over there. And you can't just plan him out of your day. You have to be listening. And he'll speak even in those little things. It may seem silly to you. But he will speak to you even those little things. Little things that you think might just be not any, may not matter to him. They do matter to him because they have to do with you. And we are the apple of his eyes. We are what he cares about on this earth. And if you haven't noticed, if you look around the world, our Creator is very much involved even to the minutest little things that we even think of as insignificant. He is very intricate. David talks about that in Psalms. I was intricately, wonderfully made. Even down to the littlest thing that we can't even see under a microscope, and yet it's going on inside of our bodies, keeping us alive all the time because He cares about even the smallest little details. He is not a vague God. He is. He's very specific in his directions. Now, maybe sometimes you start out with a small word and he sees you move on that word and he gives you more. But he's actually can be very specific. He can, tell, he can show you exactly what house you're supposed to be in, the color of the house, where the windows are in the house. I mean, down to the littlest detail, he can get very specific with you so that there's no wandering. No vacillating back and forth, is it this, is it that, is it this. If you know it already, Megan tells a testimony about her blue car. Well, Lord didn't have to tell her that car was going to be blue, but he did. Showed her exactly what kind, what color, so when she walked in the dealership and saw it, there was no question, is this the car? You don't even have to question at that point, because it's every single thing the Lord's already showed you. So he will get very detailed with you, if you'll just listen to the small voice. And the Lord still didn't address his pity party. He said, Go return in thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of, I can't pronounce that, but Abel, Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in your room. And it shall come to pass that, that, thou, that him that escaped with the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. Yeah. And yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. And he departed thence and found Elisha. It wasn't over. He still had a job to do. And I'm telling you, for us, it's not over. No way. We still have something to do. And when you hear that voice, if you'll get up and move on it, because it wasn't enough just to hear. He could have sat there and said, well, the Lord said it wasn't over and stayed in his little cage. No. He got up and immediately went and found Elisha and started operating on the word that the Lord had given him. A lot of us maybe have heard the word, but we haven't got up to operate on it yet. Or maybe you're even hearing the word today and you know what you're supposed to go do, but you got to get up and do it the next day. It's not enough just to hear. Hearers of the word don't, aren't enough. You got, can't be a hearer only. Jesus said, if you hear my words and you don't do them, you're like a man that built his house on the sand. And wind came and storm came, and the house of that, or the fall of that house was not just a fall, but it was a great fall. All right. Not just a little fall, it didn't just get a little damage. The house fell and it was a great fall. But him that hears my words and do them, you have to be a doer. Yeah. You can't be just a hearer. Right. And that's to my own self too. We sit here and we hear so much word. Very blessed. Kind of feel like the disciples were blessed. That they got to go around with Jesus and they got to hear straight from the source what nobody else got to hear. 
And there were even times when he took them aside and he explained to them things he didn't even explain to the masses. And they were in on so much word, and yet there were so many times that they weren't believers. So many times that they, we tried, Lord, but it didn't work. <laughs> so many times that they just didn't get it right, or they would argue with him. He'd say, it's my time. No, it's not your time. I have to die. No, you don't have to die. And we're so, we're so blessed here that we get so many words and so many prophecies. If you don't know, if you haven't been to other churches, not every church allows messages in tongues anymore right. and gives the prophecy for it. Not every church even allows anyone but their own personal pastor to prophesy. Right. Yeah. If it's not run through him, it doesn't get said. Right. Not every church lays hands on people anymore and prays for them. It's not a thing that's going on everywhere. Sometimes we get so used to it around here and we grow so accustomed to what's going on and yet in other places it never happens. And that's why you can see people come in here. I saw someone come in here not too long ago and their eyes were probably this big because they'd never seen anything like that before. It was all brand new to them. And we have to not grow so accustomed that we take it for granted. Now, I want you to grow accustomed in the sense that you expect to hear. Because yeah. I want you to have that here and here. I don't ever want you, you know, it, it is futile to get down and pray and not expect to hear from God. If you don't expect His presence to show up, even if you don't need anything, right. but just the expectation that He will be there, His presence will manifest, the anointing will flow, flow the glory will flow. If you don't go in there with that expectation, then it's futile. It's just repetition, it's just words, it doesn't mean anything to you, because you don't expect it to mean anything. But, I want you to have that expectancy, but I don't want you to grow complacent. Um, I was reading an article not so long ago about how the atmosphere of a room sets the tone. And it does. And they basically used this um, illustration that they had attended this college that had this very fancy, fancy library that you would have thought of, you know, hundreds of years ago, men sitting around in their coats and studying and looking all very rich and fancy and all those things we think of when we see old movies like that. But the school had kind of let the library go. It was one of those on the to-do list, but we don't have time. So everything had started kind of falling apart. And he said by the time he went, you know, there was Pepsi machines in it and all the kids just came in their shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops and it wasn't very fancy anymore. And he said basically because they let it go, it became trivial to them. Yeah. And nobody got excited about it or dressed up for it. It was just another right. place. Right. And sometimes we let the word of the Lord become like that oh, to us. Yeah. We kind of take it for granted. We hear it so much that it becomes <clears throat> excuse me, just trivial. Another good word, hallelujah, but we have no idea what it was. We don't appropriate it in our lives. We couldn't. You'd have to know what it was to be able to claim it for your life the next day as you went through your walk. You'd have to know what it was. And so one of the things that I want us to do, I want us to get up and be doers. You know, you, you can't, if you're busy doing something, it's hard to take it for granted if you're the one in the middle of it doing it. If we get right in the middle of all those prophecies and we start claiming them, and we start putting them forth. And we start getting involved. I don't care if all you have is a nickel to give towards the building fund. It is something that you are getting involved in and you are being a part of. I don't care if you have no money, but you say, hey, I can come sweep that floor up that you need swept over there. If you have nothing to give but your time, your smile, whatever you have, your prayers. Even if you physically can't come help, but you can intercede on the behalf of everybody that's here. You are then involved and it is no longer trivial to you. It is no longer something small to you. It is also no longer something so big that you can't attain it. Hallelujah. Because you start seeing it come to pass. And you start seeing all these things come to pass in your life. And I'm telling you, as you get involved in what's going on here, it's kind of like how Jesus said, put my kingdom first and all these other things will be added. Yes. Yes. We can't get so worried about our own lives that we forget to lift up what's going on in the kingdom. Because if you get involved what's going on in the kingdom, in your church, all those other things, you don't have to worry about them. They're just added to you. I guarantee you that you can't, we won't be building houses here long before we start building our own. Yes, I believe that. That's just the reality of it. 
You know, Solomon built the temple, and then he went and built his own self, a really big house, and a really great place. He made the temple wonderful and beautiful, and then he went and made his own house wonderful and beautiful. You won't build up this place and not build up your own life. You don't think the Lord's going to fill this place with people and not include your family members in it. All right. No, you get involved in this, and everything else you need is added unto you. You don't think that he'll have you lay hands on the sick and then recover and then not heal you too. Of course he will. And he's going to do it. How's he going to do it? By his glory. We won't have to worry about it. We won't have to fret about it. We're just going to hear a small voice. Isaiah said you'll hear a voice behind you saying this is the way walk you in it. You won't turn to the left. You won't turn to the right. You'll go exactly the way that you hear to go. And that's what we're going to do. We've already heard great words about it. And we're already going in that direction. But I want to encourage you this morning. Live by unction. Not by your feelings, not by your circumstances, because all of that will lie to you. Oh, yeah. All of that is, you know, anything anything temporal yeah. is subject to change at any moment. any moment. That's why Paul said, don't get your eyes on the things that are temporal. They can change. Right. Get your eyes on what's eternal. What's eternal doesn't change. The glory never changes. Hallelujah. You get in it, and the river is great. I don't care where you jump in, it's still great. I don't care what day of the week you jump in, it's still great. I don't care if you're crying one day in the glory, it's great. And if you're laughing the next day, it's great. If you're singing in tongues, it's great. If you're running around the church, it's great. It's always great. And it's always full of answers. And it's always full of everything you need. It's still full of healing. If you need healing, you can get it right in the glory. You don't even have to have someone come lay hands on you. You can be like the centurion that told Jesus, speak the word on me. Just send it. If you'll just send your word to my servant. And Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like that. In all of Israel, I haven't seen faith like that. And he said in the Message Bible, it says, and the thing that you believe is happening even now, right now. And it said from that moment on, not when the man got home, not later, right from that moment he was healed. He began to recover. And I want to encourage you this morning, start moving by unction, and you won't have to worry about is it going to happen. You won't even have to worry about when it's going to happen, because you start doing it, it's going to be just like the centurion servant right now. If you can believe it today. That's why, that's why the word says, if you can enter in today, today is rest. Yes, there was a rest for them. Yes, there was a rest for Israel. There's a rest for David. There's a rest for all these people. But if you'll enter in today, there's a rest for you too. It wasn't just for them. It was for you too. So enter into that unction. Enter into the glory. Because right now in this service, you have every right to lay hold on every answer you need. You don't got to wait another day, another minute. You can get right in the glory and get every answer you need. God bless you this morning.